as we prepare to hear the proclamation of God's word to us tonight, can I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we're reading from verses 1 to 10. One Timothy chapter four, beginning at verse one. The spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and ordered them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, rather, Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this, we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God who is the saviour of all men and especially of those who believe. This is God's word. Hey, uh, can I invite you to pray uh, with me as we call on God's name and ask um, for his blessing on this time around his precious word. Please bow with me. Our Father, we want to honour you tonight and we want to glorify you. I pray uh, that each of us, even now, that we would just be humbled in your awesome presence, that we have come to meet with the creator of this world. And uh, Lord, it is a great thing, it is a wonderful thing, it is a fearful thing, but it is a glorious thing because of Christ. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, open our eyes tonight. Uh, We just really are dependent upon you for the work of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to speak and to hear. And Lord God, we pray the truths that we hear, that they would move just beyond the intellectual realm and understanding and comprehension. Please tackle us to the ground, our hearts. Wrestle us down as you did with Jacob. And God, we pray that you would change us from the inside. And when the inside is changed, the outside will change. And by your power, the world will be changed. Lord, speak to us. We are ready. We come with Mary to seek the better portion, to sit at your feet. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. May you exalt your son. May you get great glory. May your church be radiant. And may the lost be saved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are... We have been uh, no strangers to witnessing, at the moment, wars going on, uh, as Marty had alluded to uh, in his prayers. In recent times, our eyes have seen uh, many things. We've watched 
especially in horror with the Taliban uh, take over the main city in Afghanistan and overthrow the government. And as we saw the people running for their lives, knowing that trouble was on the horizon. We've seen the violent civil war in Ethiopia, things getting very violent over politics over there, and even the conflict spilling over into Sudan uh, and Somalia. And then, of course, as was referenced tonight, we have been watching just the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and just how devastating this has been. And, and what's been at cost uh, for all of this and the lives that have been lost? And, and we've been seeing these things, and they have been dreadful. And obviously the Lord watches on with this. And we watch and we see and we become familiar with it. And the cycle of life continues with these troubles and this warfare. But it is the continuing witnessing of all of these wars that we see and we've become accustomed to, which can cause us to forget about a war that goes way back further. And that's been around a lot longer. One that originated in the heavenlies. And one that began with Lucifer seeking to lay hold of the throne of the Ancient of Days. And we know that he was banished and he was kicked out. But phase two of the warfare kicked in immediately and he declared war on God in the garden. The next phase of the battle and then humanity fell. Those who were made in his image, the pinnacle of his creation, ruined. Ruined. And everything that God said when he made that was good had been ruined. And then the phase continued. From then, men invented idols and gods of every kind. And all war broke out. All hell broke loose. And he, so, so much success did he achieve that he was given the title, and I'll say with a lowercase g, the God of this world. He laid war against God. And yet Christ, God had a plan, and Christ left heaven. And unlike Satan, he wasn't banished from heaven. He was sent from heaven, and he came to secure the victory and he won the victory at the cross. We know this. And he triumphed at the grave and he ascended into glory. And he's king and he's ruling and he's reigning. But we know that the final blow hasn't been landed yet because we read it's waiting at a later date when this great enemy who has declared all of these wars, the oldest war, he'll be cast into the lake of fire where there will be no more warfare against God and against his people. So, so tonight I want, church, I want to remind you of a war that's going on. Now for some of you, you don't even realize you're caught up in this war. For others, I want to remind you that you have enlisted in this war and you are called. So this is what I would like us to see. So as we consider 1 Timothy 4, can I encourage you to take up the sword? And open it up as we hear what God has to say. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, we, only, we can break the passage quite neatly into uh, two sections here tonight. So firstly, let us consider the rise of Satan's servants. The rise of Satan's servants. Look at verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, just look closely at that first phrase there. The Spirit expressly says. Now, that's interesting. We're in chapter 4. We've received, we've been reading a letter that's been authored by the Holy Spirit the whole way through. And by chapter 4, he says, the Spirit expressly says. The whole thing's been from the Spirit. Now he wants your focus. The Spirit is, is really, really wanting our attention here. And so what follows is a prophetic warning by the Holy Spirit. Now, what's a prophetic warning? The warning is that an exodus is coming. Not from Egypt, not from a communist regime, not an exodus of many refugees looking for safety. No, 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 something far worse. An exodus from local churches. 
and, and, and things are coming that will be incredibly grievous and distressing for the people of God. They are going to witness some grievous, grievous departures. What does he say? The Spirit expressly warns, some will depart from the faith. Now that word there, depart, ephistomai from the Greek, is very strong. That departing language. This is a deliberate, a decisive, and a willful turning one's back, a walking away. It's decisive. Now what is the walking away from? What does he say? Note what it isn't. He doesn't say that they will lose their faith. Faith is a gift from God that he gives to us to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. It's his gift. That's not what he says. What does he say? Note the wording very carefully. They will depart from the faith. The faith. Now when the scriptures say the faith, that's referring to the truths of Christianity. The gospel, the gospel truth, what makes Christianity decisive and distinct and unique, it is the truths. So what's going on here? This is referring to those who have been seen as part of the assembly. They have participated in the life of the assembly. They've accepted, they have acknowledged that they accept the truths of Christianity they have served. They've been on rosters. Their photos in the church directory. They've been amongst us. Then all of a sudden, whether quickly or slowly, all of these, all those truths that they said that they held to, they trade them all in and they walk away. I'm not talking about someone who leaves a local church to go join another local church. I'm talking about someone who walks away from the truths of Christianity. That's what the Spirit's talking about here. Now, we are seeing in our time, which is happening very rampantly, this thing called Christian deconstructionism. Have you been hearing about it? This is, this is the new title. It's about people who've been Christians or who've been in church their whole lives, especially ministers and leaders, who've now come to a point where they've broadened their understanding and now they've started considering all sorts of teachings, all sorts of philosophies and ways of life regarding sexuality and belief. And now Christian deconstruction is, is a coming back and questioning all the foundations that they were raised in with the Bible. And so someone who goes from that says, well, often I'm not uh, walking away from Jesus, but I'm not, I'm not living my life according to a book. You can't just narrow it down like that. Friends, Christian deconstructionism is a nice, cute little word for an old word, apostasy. Apostasy. Walking away from the truth that the New Testament speaks about repeatedly. Now this prophecy from the Holy Spirit, this warning, it is disturbing. When is it going to happen? It's an express warning. When is this going to be fulfilled? These grievous departures. What does he say? The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith. Now, this, the language there is future, is future, tense, future tense language. Days approaching, later times. But then when you jump down to verse 3, Paul moves from the future tense to, to the present tense and say, this is happening. This is, this is going on. So Paul, when Paul says here, in later times, he doesn't want us to think, okay, this horrific prophecy, it's going to happen just moments before Jesus comes back. Like literally before he's in the clouds, this is going to happen, and then he's coming back. That's not how he wants you to think about this. And this is consistent with the rest of the New Testament about the end times. 1 John 2.18, listen to the Apostle John. Dear children, it is the last hour. And then Peter, the other apostle, he says this in 1 Peter 1.20, in these last times. That was 2,000 years ago. So here, the last hour, the later times that this is referring to, that was brought in, this era, through Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension and glorification. When that happened, now we're in the final stage of, the, of God's calendar. 
He's brought that in. We are in that period. So now everything is heading towards the final judgment, the final wrapping up. And this falling away, this horrible prophecy, it was being fulfilled before the Apostle Paul's eyes. And it hurt him. It pained him. In the next letter, just before Paul dies, he writes again to Timothy and he says, Timothy, please come to me quickly. Why, Paul? Because my fellow servant Demas, because he's loved this present world, has deserted me. Come to me, Timothy. And then in Philippians 3.18, listen how much it grieved Paul and pained Paul what he saw happening. He says this, quote, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. I'm telling you with tears. Picture the letter drenched. Those who worked with me, they're now enemies of the cross. And friends, you know that this isn't referring to a later time because you have experienced it and you have seen it through, through painful experience. Family members that we have had that have grown up in the church, that have walked with us, have been raised in the truths of Christianity and the gospel, who have walked away and traded in for new ideas and for self-exploration. Friends, leaders, people that served alongside us for so long and have traded it all in. Not, not to go to another local church to serve Christ with all of their heart and to hear the gospel. No, who've traded in Christianity, have become apathetic. Now, this is really grievous and this ought to pain us. Please hear me here. This ought to grieve us like it did Paul. It brought him to tears. But can I encourage you? It shouldn't lead us to despair. Why? Because the Holy Spirit prophesied this would happen. This doesn't shake our faith. It confirms our faith. He's warned us in advance. Praise his name. He's not losing the war. He's already told you the stages that are going to happen in advance. Don't let it shake you. Let it remind you every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is true and can be trusted. So how does this tragedy happen? What's going to cause all of these people to leave the church? What is it? Look what it says there. They'll abandon the faith following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So all these souls are going to give ear to demonic spirits, to the teachings of demons. Those angels that fell with Satan, they are going to deceive and lure many away, many away. Now they're going to do it with fine-sounding arguments and they're going to do it with half-truths and they're going to be successful because they are going to use Scripture but they're going to twist it just like Satan did in the wilderness. He will use Scripture Otherwise, he won't get the pulpit. He will use it. But I want you to notice the spiritual realm, the spiritual warfare that is packed into verse 1. Look at it. Look what we see just in verse 1. In verse 1, it says, we have the Holy Spirit speaking and prophesying, right? The Spirit speaking. Verse 1. What do we see at the end of the verse? And we also have the speaking of deceitful spirits and demons. There's the war, friends. All in the one verse. So on the one side, you have the Holy Spirit who's seeking to guide us into all truth. And on the other side of the war, you have the demons that are seeking to lead us away from the truth. Here is the war. And this demonic luring away from the truth. It goes all the way back to the garden, as we said. It goes back to the garden. Did God really say, if you choose this path, you won't die? You won't die. So friends, please understand, there is a war for souls right now. Right now. And we are in it. We are in it. And there's a battle that's raging. Ephesians 6.12, you know it. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan isn't just a roaring lion. He's a, captive of an, a captain of an army. And he's merciless. And he hates us. Christ called him a murderer from the beginning. He has no problem slaying souls. No problem. 
And so they will follow, the many will follow demons. Now, has anyone in this room seen Satan speaking or seen a demon speaking? We haven't seen it, right? You haven't heard a demon talking? None of us. And yet Paul says they will deceive the church. They will deceive them with doctrines of demons. How are they going to do this? We haven't seen them speak. How's it going to happen? Look at verse 2. Such teachings, these doctrines of demons, they come through hypocritical liars whose consciences has been seared as with a hot iron. So the teachings come through hypocritical liars. So you hear what he's setting up here. He's told us the source. The source of the evil agenda is Satan and demons. Now he tells us the channel. The channel is hypocritical, conscience-seared liars. That's how the message is going to get in. Now, it's really important here. Though these false teachers are being used by demons, they are not innocent. And we do not go light with them. What does he say? They are liars. And they are hypocrites. They're not innocent. And we do not go easy with them. Because this is war. This is war. He calls them hypocrites. And as many of you know, Paul borrows this word, as Jesus did from the, from the Greek theater, from the acting world. And what's he saying? These false teachers, they look the real deal. They look legitimate. But they say and do not do. They say and do not do. They pretend. They act. They're theatrical with their faith. And friends, they prove to be just like their father, the devil. What does it say about him in Corinthians? Even Satan himself disguises as an angel of light. He is the greatest actor, and these servants follow in his footsteps. What else does it say? They are liars. Friends, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. The Spirit says they are lying. They claim to be sincere with you, but they're utterly insincere. Utterly. And they claim the truth. They'll bring the Bible up, but they hate the truth. And they will pervert it. And they are liars, just like their father. What did Christ say? Satan is a liar and the father of lies. It is obvious who they work for and it's obvious the cloth that they've been cut from. And here's how ruthless they are. This is war. Their consciences are seared as with a hot iron. Now God has given us very precious gifts in this world. The most precious being his word and the Holy Spirit. But there's something that God graciously gives to all all, all those made in his image, and it's a conscience. That moral alarm system that pulls us up when we go too far, when we're doing wrong, even if we don't know the scriptures. He's given us that gift. These men, these false teachers, their consciences are burnt to a crisp. Scar tissue has grown over. They've been anesthetized. They no longer feel wrong and they can laugh at wickedness and they can leave a pile of casualties and feel nothing. It's war. It's war. And that's who's coming. So the spiritual warfare that's going on that we're being warned of here, God is speaking through his servants to proclaim the truth and Satan is speaking through his servants to lead us away from the truth. There's the war. And Satan, those that he loves to use, especially amongst Christians or the church, are people who have influence over Christians. He loves university professors. He loves a college campus. That's his domain. Intellectuals, scientists, psychologists with the newest understandings of human nature, not depravity, not sin. And he will use church teachers. Let me quote here John MacArthur. He says this, 
Quote, they may be religious leaders and appear outwardly good and devout. They may teach in ostensibly Christian colleges or seminary. They may pastor a church or write theological books or commentaries. Though they wear the mask of religion, even Christianity, and wear a mask of piety, they do not serve God but Satan. End quote. So what is this all showing us? Satan has declared war against Christ and the church. His target is the church, and unfortunately, Sundays are often his busiest day. Be warned. And therefore, Christian, we've said this, Ian and myself, and we've said this many times, it is so vital with the church that we choose to commit to, the church that we call home. It's so important. A church that teaches sound doctrine because to sit under error or anything that is watered down is to jeopardize your soul. It is to lay your weapons down and to be free reign. We must be picky. And this also means, let me take it further in application, you cannot pick up any book that claims to have a Christian author. You can't do that. You can't visit any website that has a Christian attachment to it. You can't visit just any counselor who on their website says Christian or has studied. You can't listen to any podcast that claims to be Christian. You can't. You must be picky because the the demonic deception is real, it's prevalent, and it is absolutely effective. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. And our Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to disciples. The young God. So the Holy Spirit has warned us of apostasy that will come in the church. He's told us the source of the deception, the channel of deception. Now he tells you the message that's coming. He gives you the heads up. Look at verse 3. These teachers, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, If you're anything like me, when I first read that, I thought that is a bit of an anticlimax. I mean, when you look at it, this demonic assault that's coming, a grievous departure from local churches, apostasy that's going to be rampant, this demonic assault, and we'd expect, okay, what's going to lure all these people away from the truths of Christianity? These teachers must be convincing people to get the mark of the beast, to worship the goddess Artemis, or to start practicing witchcraft. What's this message that they're going to ruin everyone? And what, is, what does he say? They forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods. It seems disproportionate to the severity of the warning that the Holy Spirit is giving, doesn't it? It doesn't seem fitting. What are these teachers doing? This isn't an exhaustive list, but they are glorifying asceticism. They are exalting a life of abstinence abstinence so that true true, true righteousness is found and obtained through abstinent living. Particularly here, the ones that he brings up, a marriage and certain food. So in essence, meat, marriage, and sex are evil, are unholy. All of those things belong to physical desires, carnal desires of the physical world. They're not spiritual. They're not holy. It's not holy living. Now, these few things here, these are prevalent today. Who, who, who are considered to be the most spiritual or the spiritual elite or the most holy today in Roman Catholicism? Who is it? It's the priests. It's the nuns. It's the monks. And what do they all have in common? Vows of chastity, vows of abstinence, vows of poverty and celibacy. All of that. True holiness, true righteousness. Now, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Like you look at it and you think, okay, this is a bit legalistic what they're trying here. Isn't Paul overreacting though? I mean, he's calling it doctrines of demons. I mean, that's a bit excessive for this list. Understand this. 
any, any teaching that takes the eyes of the church of Jesus Christ is from the pit of hell. Anything that would diminish his sufficiency is the doctrines of demons. You see, these teachers, they easily and quietly so happily forget what Jesus said. It is finished. It is finished. And they elevate self-denial over Jesus' sacrifice. They do this. Jesus' sufficiency diminishes. And Jesus came to tear the veil in two. And these false teachers, they grab the cloths and they begin to sew up the veil with rules of abstinence. The pillar of the church, which it either stands or falls, is justification by faith in Christ alone. And these teachers smother that. They blur that. They put that in the background. And we know the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and they leave it back there. I'm going to give you rules. Thus, they are doctrines of demons. And how else is this teaching demonic? Well, what does it do? It calls evil what God calls good. Look at verses 4 to 5. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. See, these teachers, they call marriage unholy. And when we go back to the garden, God created everything and he said it was good. And then he saw Adam and he saw Adam alone. And God says, not good that he's alone. And he brings a wife for him. And these false teachers say, it's not good. That's not holy to do those things. And they say with foods that certain foods are unholy. You should stay away from them. Jesus came on the scene saying, it's not what goes into a man that makes him dirty. It's the stuff on the inside and that comes out and defiles him. And he declared all foods clean. You see, imagine being someone who undermines the truth of God. That's what these men are. That's exactly what they are. They are undermining God and they are correcting God. What God has said good, they say it's no good. They are assuming more holiness than God. It's unthinkable, isn't it? But it sounds exactly like Satan. It sounds exactly like him. And friends, though we don't have those things like Roman Catholicism, I want, it, I want us to be careful that this teaching can easily take root in our lives. It can slip in, especially for us who are conservative in our theology and in our beliefs. Now, what do I mean by this? We can subtly slip into thinking that enjoyment of things in God's creation is not spiritual. It's not very spiritual. That God's blessings and goodness in creation are not good for us to enjoy. Let me quote here John Stott. It's a little bit lengthy, but it is wonderful what he says here. And I hope it's helpful. Let me quote him. We should determine then to recognize and acknowledge, appreciate and celebrate all the gifts of the Creator, the glory of the heavens and of the earth, of mountain, river and sea, of forest and flowers, of birds and beasts and butterflies, and of the intricate balance of the natural environment. And we should celebrate the unique privileges of our humanness, that we are rational, moral, social, and spiritual, as we were created in the image of God and appointed His stewards. The joys of gender should be celebrated, marriage, sex, children, parenthood, and family life, and of our extended family and friends. And we should celebrate the rhythm of work and rest, of daily work as a means to cooperate with God and serve the common good. And then of the Lord's Day, when we exchange work for worship, we should celebrate the blessings of peace, freedom, justice, and good government, and of foods and drink, clothing and shelter, and our human creativity expressed in music, literature, painting, sculpture, and drama, and in the skills of strengths displayed in sport, end quote. God delights to see us enjoying and delighting in walking in nature, enjoying the sunrise, getting exercise, having fun, building friendships, seeing family, enjoying cuisines of every kind. He created you with so many taste buds for a reason. He wants you to enjoy that, playing sport when the sun's out, 
to enjoy the gift of love and marriage, to be able to go out on a date night, to have fun together, the gift of romance and sexual intimacy. He's given us these things to enjoy and to enjoy the creativity through the gifts that he gives us in making, building, establishing and sharing. All of these things. But the false teachers are saying, that's all carnal. That's not holy. That's not spiritual. That's not of the kingdom. Those are unholy things. Friends, why has God given us all of this? To richly enjoy and to glorify him with them. That everything that he gives us, we return with a word of thanksgiving and praise and to marvel and say, how wonderful is my father's world. How wonderful. See, to call these things unholy is to rob God of the glory that he deserves. And to call them unspiritual is to rob God of the gratitude and thanksgiving that he deserves for giving us these things. So friends, next time you enjoy and you try that new meal, next time you go out or you have a date night with your spouse or you go out with friends or you enjoy that get-together or, or going out and playing, do so with a thankful heart and just shoot up a word of praise to your Father in heaven who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Praise his name. So these deceitful teachings will turn the eyes off Christ, they'll undermine God's word, and they'll rob God of gratitude and worship. Now let's move to our last section here, and I'll try and move. Secondly, we've, so firstly, we've seen the rise of Satan's servants, and now, friends, the call to God's servants. The call to God's servants. Now he is going to go directly at the minister here, and then he's going to broaden it out, okay? This is for leaders in the army, and this is for soldiers in the army. So Paul shifts from Satan's man to God's man, Timothy. Look at verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Paul calls Timothy to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Now this was timely for Timothy, and this is necessary for every leader. Every leader. To be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Why is that? Because there is a temptation for every pastor and every leader. And that temptation is the desire for greatness. Greatness. To have a great, great ministry. To have many people following you. To have heaps of people listening to your sermons. To have your church more successful than the church up the road. People tuning into you. A desire for greatness to be recognized and then distinguished. But what do we see in this verse? Paul doesn't want any of those things for Timothy. He doesn't. What does he say? Rather, your longing should be to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. A good servant. Friends, isn't that what Jesus is looking for? What's he going to say when he sees us? How big was your ministry? How many rosters were you on? How many people did you win to Christ? How many people knew your name? He's not after greatness. What's he going to say? Well done, good and faithful servant. He's after good servants of Christ Jesus. And so that is the goal. And friends, this isn't for ministers alone. This is for everyone, not just for leaders, for all believers. Don't fall into pursuing greatness for your name just to be a good servant. So mothers in the room, be a good servant where God has called you, don't compete with the world. Be faithful in your home. Teach your children. Love your husband. Be faithful and make your home a place of worship and that people can come into and meet Christ. Husbands, lead your families and your wives well. Be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Nourish her as your own body. Teach her the word. Lead her in family worship. Pray with your children. Declare to them the word of God and hold out to them heaven and hell. Those of you who aren't married, use your gifts. Use your time because the days are evil. And there's a war going on. Serve him with all of your heart. Members of a local church, God has given you gifts. Now serve one another. Build each other up. Bless each other. It's more blessed to, to give than to receive, our Lord Jesus says. Look to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. That's enough. That's enough. Pursue that. Paul then goes on giving us here a few things 
of what the good minister of Jesus looks like. What does he say there in verse 6? If you point these things out before the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus. What, what does he want Timothy to point out? You'll be a good servant of Jesus as a leader if you point out false teaching and false teachers. It's part of the role. You are to be a shepherd, and one of the roles of a shepherd is to protect the sheep from danger. So this must be vital for him. What else does a good servant of Christ Jesus, is he characterized? Look what he says in verse 6. He must have good biblical training. Look at verse 6. Being brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. The good servant has good biblical training. This is theological and practical training. Where did Timothy get his good training from? First and foremost, it's not where you'd expect. Where did he get it from? He got it in his house. He got it as a little boy from his mother, Eunice, and from his grandmother, Lois. What does Paul Paul knew what an impact this had. And he says in 2 Timothy 1 and 2 Timothy 3, he says this, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. And then what does he say? How from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Who can measure the value of godly, faithful teaching in the home? It is worth years of Bible college. It is because it's daily and it's lived out. So mums, keep imparting truth to your children. Dads, keep leading your families. Those who are unmarried, keep serving, keep serving, keep serving the Lord with all your heart. What other training did he get? Well, he sat under the Apostle Paul himself. Paul said to him, 2 Timothy 3, You know all about my teachings, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, and my sufferings. A good servant of Christ Jesus is surrounded by godly Christians that they can follow and imitate. You will be good in battle if you surround yourself with godly Christians. Timothy was. Also, they continually grow in the word. Look at verse 6 there again. Being brought up in the truths of the faith there. That means that, see what it says, being brought up. That's in the present tense. This is someone who's continually trained in the words of God. This person lives in the word. They're always digging at the word. They're always mining the word for more and they're growing in it. Sometimes I cringe and think, how many, if Jesus was here today, how many ministers would Jesus rebuke like he did to Nicodemus, who was so ignorant of the word? What do you say to Nicodemus? Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? The things that are put upon the minister today to know, he needs to be an expert in finance, in real estate, in politics, in every latest trend and fashion. No, God says, he must be of the word. He must know it. He must divide it. He must explain it. He may preach it and proclaim it. Don't worry about all that other stuff. The word, the word. And friends, a godly minister must be committed to the gospel. And proclaiming it. Look what he says in verse 7. How can he be a good servant of Christ Jesus? Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. You see, he is committed to one thing. Not speculations, not conspiracy theories, not superstitions, not the latest chatter, not the newest book on church growth strategies. He's not into that. They're all speculations. They're all the wisdom of man. He's committed to the Word of God, not funny stories, not, not, not creating church in a way that will entertain unbelievers. No, he doesn't care about that. You see, the temptation for the minister today is to woo the bride of Christ with something other than the groom. That's the temptation. And don't let it happen. She needs the groom and nothing less. And the good servant will preach Christ he doesn't entertain worthless distractions and he's not hypnotized by lesser lights. He's fixated on the light of the world. 
He preaches the God-breathed scriptures, the holy scriptures, every word that proceeds from the mouth of Christ. Castle Hill, I don't, I don't know what's in store for the next few years, but if the Lord continues to bless the, this place as he has in days gone past, and if you have to appoint new pastors and more pastors in the future, look at the word for what he wants for you. Look at the word. It's all here. So the good servant is all about the word. He points out error. He's well-trained. He hangs around godly believers and he's undistracted by the wisdom of the world. Now just lastly, look how he wraps this up. Look how he ties it all in. Lastly, the good servant of Christ Jesus pursues godliness and this is of vital importance for everyone in this room. Paul is mentioned, and I've spent time on this on purpose, he is mentioned at great length how significant being trained in the word of God is. And now he shows us that great knowledge of the word alone is insufficient. You can know the book back to front and you can even speak it back to front, but it's insufficient alone. Look at verses 7 to 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Training in godliness is vital. Now, friends, what is godliness? If, it's, if knowledge of the word of God alone is insufficient, what does godliness mean? It literally means reverent living before God. It is the fear of God in the person so that all of their life, as Pastor Ian preached this morning, is centered upon God. Every part of your life is around Him. He is the center of all of it. I think the verse in the scriptures that capture godliness more than anything is Psalm 16.8. What does the psalmist say? I have set the Lord always before me. That's godliness. He is always before me. And tragically, this is the one thing from painful experience, and, and you can probably amen it, godliness is often the one thing most lacking in our lives. It's, it's often the thing that we skip over or we neglect. Friends, it is important to grow in the knowledge of the truth. It is important to have desires to be like Jesus Christ, but that's not enough. That's not godliness. Even the desires are not godliness. God has not given us knowledge of him and desires to be like Jesus, to be an end in and of themselves. That's not where it's to stop. That is insufficient. Knowledge of God is vital, but it's not godliness. Desires to be like Jesus Christ is necessary, but it's not godliness. What, 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 is, what is godliness? It must move to the next point where everything that you've come to know about God has taken hold of your heart. You have desires to be like Jesus and now by the Spirit you start living for Him and you're applying the Word of God to your life and it is seen by everyone. It's being affected. Let me quote Alexander McLaren. He says this, The soil in which the trees grow and the roots of the tree, its stem and its blossoms are all a means to the end. Fruit. Fruit. Knowledge and, des and, and desires to be like Jesus must lead to godliness. And friends, godliness is not a prayer that you can pray. It's not a hymn that you can sing. It's not a service that you can attend. It's not even agreeing to the truth. It's living out the truth. It is living it out. And Paul says here, friends, church, godliness is not something that you catch and it's not something that you find. It's something that you obtain. It's something that you obtain. What does he say? Train or discipline yourself to be godly. This is that gymnasium language. Friends, the, the athlete, he does not catch the gold medal. He does not find the gold medal. He wins the gold medal. And the soldier who's in battle, he doesn't find a victory. He doesn't catch a victory. He wins a victory. He's been training for it. Friends, we don't catch godliness or find it. You obtain it through training. So the question comes then, 
what is our means of training to obtain this thing that is vital for the war? What's our training? Where's our gym? What's our equipment? Let me give you a few here. First and foremost, it's the Word of God. Friends, reading it, studying it, listening to it, hearing it preached and talking about it with brothers and sisters, having it coming in. in. You know, I was in a prayer meeting, a small prayer meeting with, with a group of people and we went around first sharing some of our points and we all shared a couple of things that were on our heart. Then one of the gentlemen that it came to, he said, he said please pray for me. I'm not growing and I'm not where I should be and pray that I would start picking up the word of, of God more, more regularly. And, and the quote was, I've only been snacking lately. And, and he pieced what was happening, where the disconnect was. And then after he shared his prayer point, the, the next few of us shared our prayer point. But what he said so resonated with each of us, we all included that in our prayer point to be shared. We've all just been snacking lately too. We need God's word coming in. We need to feed on it. And we need the gospel of Jesus continually being reminded to us all that we have in Christ and all that he's done for us and that his blood has covered us and that he's prepared a place for us. We need that going in. You know the old saying, if the fountain is blocked, the streams will be dry. Our second means of training is prayer. And friends, I'm not talking about that little quiet time. I'm talking about persistent crying out to God, intercession, laying hold of God until you get the blessing. Okay? Praying, praying, praying. Friends, this will grow us in godliness. Can you ascend the mount of the Lord and come back down unchanged? Just ask Moses. It's impossible. Spend time with God in prayer. Spend time with God in prayer. It will lead to godliness. Another one is acts of mercy. We're so self-centered. Consider the needs of others. Visit, care, look for others, encourage others. and It will take the focus off you and you will start to reflect the God that has saved you. Paul says that the training is not easy. The discipline is not like work, but it's worth it. Look at verse 8. It's worth it. This is hard work, but it's worth it. Verse 8, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The physical exercise that you do, it's beneficial, and it might make you live longer one day. And it'll make you feel better and give you better health, but it's got a limit, limited benefit. Just think about the greatest sprinter the world's ever seen, Usain Bolt. He's won all the medals. He's got all the fame, but he's retired now because he can't keep up with everyone else. He's slowing down, and the time will come when he can no longer run, even around the house, and he'll be led and walked around by the hand. Physical training is of some value, but what does he say? But godliness has value for all things, and look at it. It holds promise for both the present life and for the life to come. How does godliness hold promise for the present life i want to encourage you and and bring you this if you pursue godliness you will enjoy a greater relationship with jesus christ you will you will enjoy more and more of his presence if you pursue godliness you know what else, what other promise it comes with you will enjoy a more powerful prayer life what do i mean by that what does james say in five sixteen? the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You will enjoy a more powerful prayer life. And thirdly, you will enjoy a more effective ministry wherever you're serving. What, what does Paul say to Timothy? Look carefully at, at what godliness brings. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Someone who watches their life carefully, who's devoted to godliness, will have great effect on their hearers in their workplace and in their family, in their church. So it holds promise for the present life. What about for the life to come, he says? Do you know we're promised rewards in heaven? We're promised many, many rewards. So what we do in this life, the godliness that we live out in this life, it will be rewarded on that day. The athlete, he cannot bring his gold medals into glory. But friends, godliness, moth and rust cannot eat at it, and time 
will not wear it away. Godliness will come with us from this life and will move into us in the next life. Yes, naked we came into this world and naked we shall leave. But when we stand before God, our godliness that we lived in life will become perfected when we see Jesus Christ face to face. It will not be a waste of time. It will not. It will not. So friends, I close. We're in a war. We're in a war. And the battle rages. Be focused. Give yourself wholly to this. Serve Jesus Christ with all your might. And do not waver from the truth. Do not waver from this. You can trust it with all of your heart. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you uh, that it is sufficient and it speaks to us where we're at. We thank you that it has wonderful, great and wonderful, precious promises. We thank you that it brings comfort. We thank you that it also challenges us. Lord, we need it. But we thank you that we see the victory is won. That was Christ's victory. We thank you that we get to share in the spoils. But I pray that we would be faithful servants, that we would engage, that we would be men and women who hold fast to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whatever the cost may be, may we wear it because it is worth it. Christ is worth it. And I pray that each of us would make it our aim to train for godliness to live godly, to not be content with more Bible knowledge, to not even be content with desires to be like Jesus, but to be like Jesus and to live for him. Please, God, help us in these things. May we be a blessing to this world and may we be a blessing to the family of God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.